Heavenly Father, as we enter into this time of worship, we come with open hearts and receptive spirits. We ask that you would prepare the soil of our souls to receive the seeds of your truth. Let your spirit move among us, stirring within us a hunger for your presence. As we engage in songs and prayers and the reading of your word, may your presence touch every individual, drawing us closer to you. Break down the barriers that may hinder our connection with you and create within us a longing to be transformed by your divine presence. And as we learn a little more today about Gideon and the challenges of being fearless today, may we never forget you keep us under your watchful, loving eye. We sense this connection with you increase as we spend more time in prayer, in study, and in corporate fellowship. You are the only true God, the one who desires relationship, who waits for us to connect, our Father who will reach out to us at times so unexpectedly and, and so needed. Whether it's Baal or the novelties of wealthy culture that keep us from spending more time with you, false gods are everywhere. May we recenter and refocus. May we remember that the armies of angels are, are available to us as messengers, but also warriors and protectors. And as we grow in relationship with you, may our worship be authentic and our prayers reverent and in awe. Help us to remember that you want to hear from us. You wait for us and you do speak to us today. As individuals, we experience your presence in so many different ways. Usually that still quiet voice tugging at our heart or a serious electrical accident at the church reminding us that miracles are happening in 2024. Compassionate Father, we intercede for those who are unable to join us in worship today due to illness or other circumstances. Reach out with your comforting presence to those who are isolated and unwell, bringing them to healing, strength, and restoration. Let them feel your embrace, knowing that they are held close in your loving arms. We pray for their well-being and connection to your divine grace. Those in our church family who are sick, who are hurt, emotionally hurting, dealing with finances, mending family fences, concerned over the state of the world, we pray for them. Faithful God, we lift the next generation to you. Bless our children and youth with a deep, and genuine faith that is firmly rooted in your truth. Guide them by your spirit, leading them in paths of righteousness and wisdom. May they grow to be bold and courageous followers of Christ, standing firm in their convictions and shining as lights in the world. We pray for the spiritual growth and empowerment of the young ones among us. And as we will learn today, we can put it out on an altar called, the Lord is peace. May our prayers be that, prayers of peace. Humbly and with repetition, we continue to ask for revival and spiritual awakening in our church and beyond. Holy Spirit, ignite a passionate pursuit of you among your people. May our hearts burn with a desire for deeper intimacy, fervent prayer, and unwavering devotion. Let your fire spread, transforming lives and communities with the power of your presence. May your name be glorified as we passionately seek you and make you known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So our reading this morning is from the book of Judges, chapter 6. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background to this uh, passage. Um, this is about 
just trying to find the date here. This is around 1256 BC, the time of the judges. And this is when the Israelites were sort of guided by just random people that God chose to guide the people. And it was a time before kings were appointed too. So it was also the time of about more than 200 years after the Lord had enabled the Israelites to leave Egypt. However, now we're at the time when the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. The Midianites and the people from the east then ravaged the land, and the Israelites were so destitute that they did cry out to the Lord. So in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Oprah that belonged to Joash, I'm going to say this right, <laughs> the Abiezrites, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that is really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, that's about 30 liters or 120 cups of flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in Oprah of the Abazarites. That same night, the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of, the, of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bowl as a burnt offering. So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. May the Lord have his blessing to this word.
It's always nice when you're the reader and you have to come up and find those Old Testament words and pronunciations. They're always big. Thank you, Pam. Great job. So today, we're going to take a big, big leap backwards and head from the Gospel to the Old Testament. And you know, it's important that we jump into areas of the Bible. We may not see the pages as well-worn. And yes, my Bible, and I'm going to hide it back here, I think it's hidden, is not well-worn in certain passages of the Old Testament or certain pages, but I'm getting there. Not quite fully wrinkled to how I would like it. And today, I wonder how many of us have been in the book of Judges. Yes, it is an absolutely incredible book. And I encourage you to read a little more, as I always do. If you read this book, let's read all of it. But I encourage you, because you will find so much related to the character of God. So many stories in there. You will find angels, Deborah, and Samson with his beautiful hair. But the next few weeks, we're going to look at an incredible biblical name. And I love the name, but enjoy his story even a little better. A warrior, like many we will see in Judges. When reading, I couldn't help but think of how much turmoil Israel has been grounded in. It has never stopped for them, so it seems. It seems there are never-ending battles and wars in that part of the world. And look at today. It's still happening. It's still going on. And remember that when you're reading, we need to again think of culture, the time periods, the historical genres. We need to have a look at that. And I'm not a fan of the phrase, the Old Testament God of war. I don't go there. Our father is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is a God of justice, but he is also a God who loves us so much. He had a plan to ensure that all have a chance to engage in relationship with him. God was working out the redemptive plan for humankind since day one of our failure in the garden. Our God is all about redemption because of his endless love for us. So here we go, the three sessions on Gideon. A great name, an awesome God story. So to get to Judges, if you have your Bibles, if you want to, that's okay. If you don't, that's okay too. First five books are the Pentateuch, Pentateuch 5, and then you have two J's, Joshua and Judges. You'll get there. To make sense of it all, we had better know what is happening in the land. And thank you, Pam, for giving a bit of a, a preview of that. There's lots going on in Judges prior to this, this uh, passage. So you will see this phrase at the start of many passages in Judges. It will say, again, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Chapter 6 with Gideon starts this way as well. But prior to this, they had 40 years of peace. They had 40 years of peace, but now they're into it again. So if you have your pew Bibles or your own Bible, notice that because of the disconnect with God, it states clearly, and for seven years, he gave them into the hand of the Midianites. And Midian, their leader, was ruthless, not a good guy. Scripture says he was oppressive. So because of that, the Israelites were hiding in caves, cracks and crevices, wherever they could get to. And this is an amazing current event type thing that we can look at. Verse 4, the crops and land they camped on were destroyed all the way to where? Current event, Gaza. Nothing was spared. Sheep, cattle, donkeys. How very awful. Gaza, again, is in the front page of the news. And it's vital to know where these Midianites come from. What is their story? Where did they come from? So the writer of Judges no doubt saw in these events the fulfillment of the covenant curses outlined in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And that's something for you to look at at another time. Not from the pulpit today. The primary agent of judgment is identified as the Midianites but they were accompanied by Amalekites and Easterners, it's been told. So the Midianites were a semi-nomadic people of the Sinai Peninsula and Western Arabia. 
And this is an important fact. They're well connected to our church family in many ways, the Old Testament. They were distant relatives of the Israelites, descended from Abraham by his second wife, and the Israelites' relations with the Midianites was a problem in the Old Testament, according to Genesis uh, 37, if you are taking notes. The Midianites were involved in the sale of Joseph to Egypt, but they did not receive any judgment for that. So long range, Joseph himself viewed them as agents of divine providence, which is interesting. So in the Exodus narratives, the Midianites are painted in an extremely positive light, not a bad one. They provided Moses with a haven when he fled from Pharaoh. Indeed, his wife was a daughter of a Midianite priest. So there's a lot of connections here. So while in their land, Moses received his call from God while in their land. Then having led them out of Egypt, he brought his, his entire nation here. And that's Exodus 3. So on Midianite soil, the Israelites entered into covenant relationship with Yahweh and received the revelation of his will, the Torah, which is? Oh, somebody spoke. <laughs> Somebody's answering me out there. <laughs> A short version, the Ten Commandments. We'll just call it the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments came about through on Mid Midianite soil, which is very, very interesting. So a key note here, Moses' Midianite father-in-law, Jethro, even had a hand in the civil reorganization of the nation. They were part of it. So once the Israelites left Sinai, relations with the Midianites deteriorated, as we read this morning. The Midianites played a key role leading Israel away from Yahweh. And the Midianites were officially now known as an enemy of God and his people. They're now enemies. So this new policy was divinely sanctioned, caused a full-scale war against them. Numbers 31. So the revival and expansion of Midian into Israel caused instability in the region. And again, think of the Middle East today. It sounds like judges all over again. The land was invaded to collect the spoils of war. But like swarms of locusts, it says, the Midianites, they ravaged the land. They ravaged it, destroyed items and, and land to break their spirits, instill fear. And I wonder, how many modern-day parallels do we see here? I'm just going to take one. Look at Russia and Ukraine. The attacks on Ukraine are demolishing civilian buildings, hospitals, maternity wards, playgrounds, it's about breaking the spirit by going after these things. The same thing was going on back then. So the Israelites under the gun again do what? They cry out to God, help us. That's all God needs to hear. He wants that reaction. He wants that connection. So as always, the God who some label as a warring God revealed his character. And what was that? He loved, he listened, and he acted. And we also see what triggered God's response, because they cried out to him. And to end Midian's rampage, a terrible oppressor, God sent a prophet to help. Who was the prophet? Gideon. Gideon was the prophet. So God does remind the Israelites, as you look at verse 8 onward, what he has delivered them from and how Israel worshiped false gods regardless. So God is telling them what's, what, what has happened in the past and what he's delivered them from. He's res rescued them. So it's no wonder God was building this redemptive plan, another reminder of God's love and his grace. He knew this was a temporary repentance for the Israelites. And the sin, and sin with a capital S, still required the ultimate solution. And that redemptive solution would eventually be Jesus. So it's a great verse where God proclaims his sovereignty. Verse 10, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. And how direct can this be? <laughs> do not worship the God of the Amorites. Well, how clear can that be? Do not worship the God of the Am Amorites. Do not. And it's ironic that in our highly educated world and look back to our ancient world, our pointing figures come flipping backwards here. That's for sure. 
those inside and outside the church. So many are still looking for something better, something that culture accepts better than Yahweh or greater than Yahweh. But the only true God who loves us despite our searches for something better, he still loves us despite our searches. Never forget that you could be entertaining an angel or angels at any time of your life, maybe under an oak tree. Verse 11 is the called out start for Gideon. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak belonging to Gideon's father. And the angel asked dad for Gideon. Where's Gideon, the son? Well, Gideon was threshing wheat for the Midianites of all things. So remember that angels have roles and hierarchies. The angel was a messenger angel. Met Gideon with these words. The Lord is with you. Then he continues. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. It's one of those moments, I'm sure, for, for Gideon. Excuse me, Lord, or angel, all of this oppression, despite hearing of the wonders, Egypt, Pharaoh, and the parting of seas. Where did all that go? And my clan is the weakest of them all. I'm the warrior with the smallest army? He's basically saying, God, God, you could do all of this yourself. Why are you asking me? So God is going to show them once again how he uses regular God-fearing people to do great things for his kingdom and chosen Israel. We all have a kingdom mission, but we must listen and look for God. Listen to others who just might be that unknown angel giving direction, friend, angel, whatever it might be. For now in Judges, I would say a war is brewing, a holy war where Israel is going to be rescued. So Gideon is called, and suddenly while he's preoccupied with this threshing activity, a messenger of Yahweh appears, seated under the oak tree. It's always a tree, isn't there? I wish we had those trees. Seated under the oak tree that apparently provided shade and shelter for the wine press. And the wine press, and had, the reason it was there, because it was shade for him threshing, doing the, wine, doing the threshing for the wine press. It was a shelter for him, and he was hidden. Because the separation of chaff would blow around. People would see that there was work going on over there. It would be seen. So Gideon had to do his work undercover. Gideon must have been on high alert. Suddenly an angel, the commissioning, and verse 11 provides the reader with that vital background information for understanding the personality and the mission of Gideon. First, it identifies him by name, Gideon, which means hacker or hewer, a function he will soon be called upon to fulfill as he destroys the altar of Baal on his father's property. Gideon may have, had a, Gideon may have been a nickname for him, but there is some evidence of that historically, although I'm most content with Gideon, as the angel called him that name. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior, is an incredibly strange way to begin a conversation. But it brings Gideon's attention to the central theme and issue in this narrative. Where is Yahweh when you need him? The opening statement is also strange. First, how can Gideon be addressed as, mighty, as a mighty warrior or hero when he is threshing his grain in the wine press and hiding under the oak? He looks anything but heroic, does he? Not like a mighty warrior. But during this conversation with the heavenly envoy, Gideon is a little cheeky. He's sarcastic, which is somewhat surprising. But we will learn Gideon is still not realizing who this messenger is. Why have the miracles stopped? The change from singular you to plural us suggests that Gideon did not even hear the messenger's personal word of assurance. Instead, Gideon goes two ways, two conclusions that undoubtedly express the feeling of Israel, how they felt. Number one, Yahweh has abandoned Israel. And number two, Yahweh has delivered the nation into the Midianites' hands. So Gideon's response to the divine messenger is theologically correct, but the tone of his voice is wrong. The blame game begins. 
Instead of acknowledging Israel's responsibility for their present crisis, he blames God. Gideon is an example of those who know what God has done in the past, who have memorized the creed, but find it unfulfilling by their present situation. Stories of past deliverance mean nothing to Gideon right now. All he can see is the terror of the Midianites. I understand that. Despite all that Yahweh has done for the children of Israel, the miracles and the promises have been fulfilled. So Gideon feels that what they were dealing with is nothing compared to battling these Midianites. 6.14 says, but the divine messenger ignores Gideon's comments, ignores them. He pushes through the debate and continues with the truth, like Moses, debate and doubt, along with other characters in the book of Judges. And there's so much happening there in a very few verses. Now, this is just the opening message of Gideon, so we will be building on today's message over the next couple of weeks. What can we take out of this half of the chapter? So often with a commissioning, whether it seems to be a minor task or a big one, the doubts and lack of confidence needs to be built upon. Much like the disciples who walked and lived with the Son of God for three years, they often engaged in the same type of rhetoric. Just show me. Help me to understand. It didn't work. I don't believe it's him, says Thomas. It goes on all throughout the Bible. Gideon, like all of us, needed that extra amount of reassurance. Gideon was called as the agent to help save Israel, but had to be sure this was all real. He asked, if I am the chosen one, don't go anywhere until I can bring an offering. Very Old Testament. I love it. And the agent said, I will wait for you. Gideon retrieved some meat and broth and offered the items under the oak tree. Instructions were given. The angel of the Lord touched the meat and bread with the tip of his staff. And the rocks flared with fire and burnt up the meat and bread. And the angel's gone. And I find this so interesting. Gideon now, now he realizes, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. No kidding. <laughs> All of this really was of Yahweh. So Gideon is encouraged again. Peace. Do not be afraid. You are not going to die. Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it, the Lord is peace. So Gideon was being prepared, yet he was still not all in. On his father's property was an altar to Baal and an Asherah pole. And we've discussed this in the past uh, from Paul and how Paul would, would have dealt with that. Our God is a jealous God and syncretism or pluralism is not an option. Baal worship involved violent acts of human sacrifice, and much more. It doesn't match the God of love that we know. A proper altar was built, and a substantial meat offering was given. This was the atonement system of old. Gideon was doing all the things asked of him, and by doing so, would have God's full favor. All of these mind-blowing events are happening, yet Gideon continues to look like the water boy not the lead warrior to take on this band of invaders. He's getting there, but he's still the water boy. What does verse 27 say? I know I'm going past our reading a little bit. The altar was built and the offering gathered, but under the veil of night, once again, Gideon ventured out. Like the wine press at the beginning, Gideon is still afraid and he's hiding, concerned over the townspeople seeing him and fear of his own family. So with that, we will continue the story as Gideon becomes the terminator from the water boy, restoring the Israelites. So what should excite us over this passage? In today's passage, we see that in the eyes of God, Gideon was a mighty warrior, specially chosen by God to deliver Israel from the hands of the Midianites, even though Gideon is not quite there in believing it. God in his providence had most likely designed and developed Gideon with this distinct purpose in mind. This was his job. This was his calling, equipping him with the strength and valor he would need to fulfill the mission he was destined to receive. Remember our go-to verses. 
I know the plans I have for you, Jeremiah. These are not punchlines. They are destinies for us. All of us have been commissioned for something special. When God calls us to a task, he will be faithful to equip us with the tools needed to accomplish that task. Gideon wanted added assurance that this angelic message was truly from God. In the Bible, sometimes doubts are viewed as hindrances or even deterrents that slow the work of God, preventing the Lord from moving or acting the way he, should like, he would like to. We know that's all part of God's sovereign planning. We often see this with Jesus in the Gospels. In this case, God honors Gideon's desire for assurance, likely because God knows Gideon's heart. He sees that his intentions are pure. The Lord recognizes that Gideon will be all in once he fully, is fully confident that this is a God thing. This is a God thing. So this is the biggest takeaway for me, and I pray for you as, as you search your heart for God's plan in your life, or an answer to move forward on something small or big in your life. Gideon needs assurance in order to proceed with confidence. The kind of confidence that comes from knowing that God is not only in the thing, so I say that again, knowing that God is not only in the thing that we feel called to do, but that he is the very source of its existence. He's in it. We know our work or our sense of calling is of God. We can pursue it with our whole heart. So when we know our work or our sense of calling is of God, we can pursue it with our whole heart. So, part two and three in the upcoming weeks, we will see Gideon grow. When God tells Gideon to replace the altar of Baal with an altar of the Lord, exchanging false worship for true worship. Gideon appears to act from a place of fear instead of acting from a place of peace. He decides to follow God's orders under the veil of night instead of during the light of day. In doing this, he obeys God only partially, for God commanded him to live in peace, not in fear, trusting that the Lord would protect him and defend him from his enemies. So I think all of us have some Gideon in us, don't we? We need reassurance. We need affirmation to step up and out sometimes. If God has called you, he knows you have the gifts to do the job. It may take some growth, but when you are called, he knows you are fully capable because he designed you. So let's see how Gideon fares next week. Part two, coming on Gideon. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may we grow in faith, following your voice, your calling, looking to affirm your will through the Holy Spirit those in the body of Christ who encourage us in giftings they see in us. Help us to be fearless by looking through the dim glasses of faith that so often gets obscured. May we never forget the words of Jesus that because of the Holy Spirit sent at Pentecost, we would do great things, great things for the kingdom to the glory and the honor of our Heavenly Father. We pray that as we study Gideon over the next couple weeks, we see faith and courage and peace that it will resonate in our lives, serving you each day with humility and purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.